Tell us when. And we're live at the hive. Tell us when. When? Have you seen Ganugwit's back sweater? Who? Ganugwit. Is that you? No. That's JT. What? And what's that behind you? That's not a back sweater. Well, if it isn't the crew. <laughs> Hi everyone. Say hi to the stream. All the nice stream folk. Hi mom. Oh, secret peanut. Secret peanut. Oh, look at that. Oh yeah. You know, it's times like this when I'm alone where I really get to think about things. That's how not far, good. How far are we? Oh, I'm sorry. We made Peanut sad. I'm going to shut up. And go back to where the signs say pole. What's going on in here? Oh, Nick's relaxing. You can barely see him, but he's there. I'll come. I'll come everyone. Look at that board. It's all ready for the Blue Album. We have Tim, good. We have Essay, how oh, good, good, good. Got a bunch of drums, that's Chad, bass. Do the people on the stream know that Speaking this is that? a uh, Rupert Neve console and Rupert Neve recently passed away? That's correct. That's correct. Rupert Scott's Neve, the uh, illustrious English engineer, passed away a few days ago. It really cares about this. These, these two together are just unstoppable. Make sure we always associate Scott Charleston with Rupert Neve. Now he passed away, and he actually. The manual for the desk. The manual for the desk is actually a fascinating read. Uh, oh yeah. I bet the people at home want to scan it. <laughs> we'll start at page one. But Rupert Neve actually came to the hive at one point to make sure this thing was installed correctly. He said it was too hot. So that's why the air is so cold in here. Everyone, that's Bobby. Bobby. Follow me. Nope, we're getting ready. Getting ready. Not too much going on right now. Everyone's hanging out outside because it's so nice today. JT's taking the trash out for us. That's very kind of Hey, Devon, you just brought the trash in? Dave Sporton. Yeah. Say hi to my family. Oh, hey. If you're watching, hopefully you're watching. Hello, family. Oh, yeah. A couple of days late. Yeah, it's happy birthday yeah. to Tim. Yeah. Yeah. This guy. It's still my birthday. Dave, you not really about about it's still yeah. Yeah. birthday week. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's a lot of things on the There is. Dave's got his alien eye makeup on there in honor socks. of the Blue Album. Look at socks. those socks. There are socks. Hey. hey, how you doing? I'm good. How about you? Not too bad. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. I can hear you. Are you in your car? Yeah. Little tiger's still sleeping, man. Oh, uh, it's all good. Not a worry. Uh, so here you cool to do this car. right now? Yeah. Cool. I'm going to ring paint it and, and see what he has to say. Hey, he's a big club ball with hair. Something that, you know, that. Let's Hello. see who we got. Yeah. yeah. What up? How you doing? Are, are we? Why is my phone? Oh, it's the real ass dog. <laughs> what up? That's the real yeah. roster. Yeah. Hey, hey, what's up? All right. Hello. Hey. Hey. Cat's in his car. Yeah. This is right, Rocky. Sorry. Is Rocky a kitty cat? Short hair. We have another cat, but yeah, 
Does Rocky have any good stories about Ron St. Germain? Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. I think we lost him. How you Welcome doing? to the show. Good. Oh, man. I'm happy to be here. Boy, there it is. Uh, what's, graveling? what's going on? Well, look at that little guy. Ah, what's going on I there? Hi, yeah. this guy. guy. This guy's a drummer. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, oh. Home dog. When I come back to California, I'm going to drive myself up there and I'm going to fix that smoke alarm. Is that still beeping back there? Oh, my God, it is. That- I'm going to fix it myself. I don't know if you can catch it on this. It's <laughs> Don Bag Daryl guitar, and it's just right next to it. I'm going to wow. check in a ladder when I come. Oh, my God. Are you at home, or is this your uh, studio spot? This, have you never been here? No, I've only been to, like, uh, I've only been to Peanuts House and, and Uncle's. You know, the, the that's so funny, dude, because I, I mean, I did a Zoom with Paul Reed Smith, and I felt so bad about that. I actually thought of you, because you know, so, I'm so used to it, just chirping. But uh, re- another issue is I need a ladder. Yeah, I don't have a good ladder. All right, that's better. I'm less red. Well, I'm in my car, and I, Evan said he was going to filter out my nose hairs, so. Where's the virus down? Oh, well, oh, oh, oh. Hopefully we're still here. He's, he's an absolute drummer. He does. He has a couple of mannerisms that you have. That's pretty funny. So he's part of the team so far. I'll probably have to chase him at some point. He sounds like my six-year-old. I'm seven. All right. So what are we doing? Uh, I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Basically, uh, who is Ron St. Germain? 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 Ron St. Germain. Are you asking me? Ron St. Germain is um, an excitable one. Um, (laughs) Ron St. Germain is is so many things. Who I mean? That is the most badass dude that I've ever met in my life, hands down kind of last generation of real producers producer engineer i know they're they're still around now but it's like the last of that golden age of dudes that knew how to take apart tape machines and record onto tape and make record real albums you know it was a dream of ours to work with ron saint from his work with bad brains and living color he's still the guy who produced and mixed and recorded those uh, classic Bad Brains albums. And we had just always wanted, we'd just been so impressed by his work. And then when we reached out around grassroots, he was very excited to work with us. So that was just, there's just so so much excitement there. But um, yeah, getting to work with Sane on the Blue Album was very mind blowing. We were living a dream. I don't know what he's doing now. Hopefully he's enjoying himself. I don't know if it was my first saint memory. It's a bona fide early memory, though. Um, so Nick and I are in my mom's car. We're tripping balls. And um, <laughs> I don't even know how many tags of LSD we took. But we are flying down the road. And, and Nick's like, he is going off on the new Bad Brains record. And I knew of Bad Brains, but I wasn't like a fan at that moment in time. But anyway, he puts on the album Quickness and that Ron Saint had produced. And it's probably a combination of that, the acid <laughs> flying down as South Omaha Street at night. Nick and I just kind of getting, we're still getting to know one another, that whole, you know, sort of trying to paint a picture there. And um, and then Nick just cranking my mom's Honda <laughs> system. <laughs> He's like, listen to this. And dude, <laughs> I was, dude, I was like immediately a fan then of that band and that album in particular. That's to, to this day, my favorite Bad Brains record. I mean, <laughs> dude, this guy goes, for the gusto, the top of the line, 
the most badass ideas <laughs> always it never fades and with most people over time you know that kind of fades <laughs> then it kicks in and it's so <laughs> you're tripping this guy is just one of a kind and um and we were very fortunate that we as a band uh, ever ever worked with him and then you're in your teens and then this music comes on and like what what and dude it was just like from then on it seems like we've had the gas stopped <laughs> <laughs> i guess we first heard about him when he was working with bad brains um that's when I first heard about him when he's working with Bad Brains. And then, um, and we loved those records. And those records really had a part in forming uh, the, the 311 style. And I equate that moment to Saint because Nick definitely name dropped, name dropped him at that moment. So, yeah, it's probably the first time that I heard Ron Saint's name. And um, so that would be my earliest memory. I don't remember the the first time that we talked to him or, you know, I, I maybe Adam reached out to him and and he agreed. And then at that point, he flew out to um, to L.A. to our house where we had a band house on Macapa Drive and started helping us put the blue record together. And then I think that's probably 1994 in the sort of the winter of 1994 in California, I think is when that was. You know, when we were making the, it might have been when we were making the blue record or after that, forget, but we lived up over on, uh, off Mulholland there. And, uh, yeah, it was probably, maybe it was the blue record because he's in random. There's lyrics about the hawks and the mice or whatever. But, um, he went, I think he had Peanut in his, he would give people rides in his airplane. And I forget who, if it was just Peanut was with him or what, but he would come out of, van eyes over there with his airplane <laughs> we, he's like all right man we're up go up on your roof so we went up on the roof of our house there in the hollywood hills and it wasn't too far off the 101 there but he did a couple flybys really low right over our house and you would i mean after 9 11 there'd be no way to get rid of that i'm sure it was totally illegal even back <laughs> doing but you know like basically dive bombing our house with this airplane and uh i got still footage of it but no I, no one had phones back then or anything with video but just to hear the roar of that engine sounded like the meanest biggest hot rod you've ever heard just buzzing down over our house right there and the neighbors and everything are just probably like what the fuck going Ozzy on osborne style totally i mean he flew his airplane kind of like other people drive their motorcycles he's just like yeah i'm gonna roll over there for a minute i can't recall exactly the first time we interface with ron i do remember one i don't know which album it was but we finished one record with him and we are in the midst of like playing uh 007 right the game hmm. we end that record we're playing that game we do a tour we do i don't know i don't even know how many years went by it wasn't a lot of years but some time had passed anyway the first day he comes back in to do the next record and i forget which record it is we are playing the same game and he comes in the hive he's like first thing he says you motherfuckers are still playing that game <laughs> <laughs> the fact that we had a chance to work with him like right in right as things were kind of still very analog but they were switching over to digital like there was a lowercase digital in recording music and and creating music just in general you know you'd have to wait hours and hours to render and and edit or something like that so it really wasn't worth it and and you just got good at your instrument and uh that's that's the era that we <laughs> that we met Ron St. Germain and, and he taught us a ton. I mean, he taught the, the sound nerds more, more than me because he's such a sound nerd, but just like catch capturing vibe and capturing, capturing performances. That's what it was all about. I mean, Scotch is probably the last dude that we've worked with. Although no, we work with Bob Rock is kind of from that era and stuff like that. But, um, you know, you don't, you get any younger than that. You kind of aren't old enough to really have, 
worked in these studios when it was like a heyday of um, so busy that you, if you could get half a day of time, you would go into the studio and work half a day if they could fit you in or whatever, you know I mean? Just so busy. And it was such a, a bigger business. Now all those studios, most of them are gone. Ron St. just brought a lot of experience of so many stories that he had of working. I think he was a, an assistant at Electric Lady Studios back in, in New York, back in the 70s. His first day, first day working in the business, who does he meet? He meets John Lennon, man. Like, it's history, right? It's connecting like these these eras and this energy and, and this flow. And it's a continuum. He was in the, the Broadway production of Hair. He tells that as being um, just this like craziest time with everybody was, you know, in New York in the 70s and the, you know, long haired revolution and sexuality being explored. Uh, he said that was just a, a crazy time of stuff that was going on in the middle of the play on stage you know he said guys girls you name it it was a complete free-for-all like that's what it was all about and and him coming in the room and just being pretty much on fire at any given moment night or day was just helpful you know to get us into our uh, you know best performances possible and that's what you hear on tape when we're working with ron st germain yeah and peanut nailed it um, he had a very analogish approach, which worked super well for the time period and for the energy that was happening during those years. And we'd all been living tightly together on a tour bus. And, and the vibe he was trying to create at that time was, hey, let's all get in one spot and have this organic thing happen. And I'll capture it over here on these analog machines and we'll just blow the place up. I had two notes here that I wrote down. I was just thinking, I was, it just came to mind when I was thinking about it the other day. Um, but one of them is the word scrunch. Uh, which I, scrunch. I, think, I think we might have learned about scrunch. I, I forget if, I, it seems like where, where I heard it first was scrunch, you know, like, um, and the Blue Album's got a lot of scrunch on it, you know. Mostly he brought uh, just so much wisdom about what gear to use how to capture energy um he definitely helped with the with song suggestions and arrangement suggestions but i'd say he focused a little bit more on the engineering um and had such particular preferences about using the neve preamp and the certain mics and and mic placement and he, he was just uh you know, a, a wealth of information, especially on the engineering. It's got a lot of scrunch, a lot of, you know, that guitar harmonic kind of stuff and musicality of the scrunch. So when Saint came out, yeah, basically we were doing the same thing. We had written a bunch of songs. We did, I don't think we recorded actual demos. We, we kind of did the demos of the blue record by ourselves and on our own personal time. So when Saint got there, we had already put it together as a band and it obviously still in raw form. But, um, but you know, we still did kind of a pre-production session, not really a recording thing, but just listening and getting ideas. And I guess he was just waiting until we were uh, sounded good enough to go ahead and go into NRG and record it. So much about scrunch, but this, this is the first record of ours that I think we kind of learned of the scrunch, how important it is. It's like on the boundary there between the, the human on the inside there to the outside in your instrument there, that the scrunch is that like reactive zone in there. It's somewhere in there. You know what? Without fully understanding, I understand. He just brings a lot of excitement because he's a wiry dude that's always wearing leather pants. Well, yeah, you'd come in and he's already freaking there. <laughs> like this dude, <laughs> dark, like the leather pants are as tight as fuck. And a, and a Yankees cap. He's just a, he's just a rock and roller at heart. And he gets very worked up. He gets very excited. He spry, wiry man. He'll jump up when he's excited about something. He'll jump up on the counter and telling stories, stomping his feet. <laughs> Just like very excitable guy. I think, you know, he just taught us to 
look for sound quality and um, engineering purity. Yeah, he made it to where we tried different things. Some things didn't work. <laughs> I, remember, I remember he had this idea to do a whisper track on um, what became a B-side firewater. And it was just so ill-fitting. <laughs> <laughs> that was a technique of they used during that time period. Yeah, the whisper track. And like Scotch was saying, it's the... The Blue Album is the only album we recorded without a click, and we recorded all in the in the same room together. You know, hold on, no way, wait, no, nobody had a click, no clicks. There might have been a, there was a starting click, you know, there's a tempo start, but we weren't listening to a click at all. We were just we were just playing, and you know, I I point that wow. out to the other guys in the band, and Scotch agrees with me. I'm like. Huh, I wonder why they went over so well. Like, of course, the songs were, you know, the songs that they were, but just when it's about performance and it's not about phoning it in, you you get in there and you play those notes exactly the way you're supposed to. And we and we're capable of that. And I want I want to get back to that someday, but I I see that as kind of a lost argument. But I love making it. So I don't so I keep at it every once in a while. When you're That's in the room good. with each other and you're kind of looking at each other, it, it builds up a certain energy that can't really you know be just kind of copied by doing it at separate times in different places you couldn't mess up you know there, there were overdubs and and stuff it was it was mainly about getting chad's take right and that's why it's so steady because of who he is and how exacting he ex expects his performances to be but we were in oh, the no doubt while he was doing that so it was it was kind of relentless there would be lots of takes chad is chad is not a a one take guy he's 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 going to do it until it's right, and it's not going to be right for a little while. It's going to be so it's going to take multiple performances. These were primarily live takes. Yes, yeah, they all they all are. There all were a are. few patch ups, but for the most part, they were all that all happened right there. And I actually remember we didn't have a click at all going on down, so it was just me like hearing a click in my head and then going for it on the intro. And that that take that you hear that opens down was played, you know, freehand with no no click or anything like that. And you can't go back and redo it if there's no click because there's nothing to play to when you're playing by yourself. So it was it was the throw and go, it was capture it live. And I seem to remember maybe we would capture like three or four basic rhythm tracks um, per day. So I would say we had most of the basic tracks done in like a week and then we had a few weeks to do overdubs and vocals and solos and all the samples and stuff that we were we were having fun with but he he supported us doing modern stuff too like you know scratching was a pretty new thing at that time i had sure. a um we we shared a band uh akai mpc sampler that we would uh get various you know noises and drum sounds and every and just kind of sync them in but on that album we had to play it freehand a lot like if you listen in um the song misdirected hostility there's a lot of 808s in there but those are actually um i went and had this boss rack piece that had these kind of synth sounds that you could trigger with your guitar and i just went in there and edited one until it was just a sine wave and made like an 808 sound and i actually played the 808s that you hear on misdirected hostility on my guitar um to trigger them. and and actually down too there's a there's an 808 that drops it on the one of every measure and uh that, that was triggered off my guitar so he definitely indulged us you know making up stuff as we go we we put um i played a fair amount of clavinet um like in all mixed up and then i would i would play along with the song and then get like my favorite one bar from it and sample that in the mpc and then just trigger that every time because to make it more hip-hop you wanted like an exact repeat instead of you know playing it um more freehand sure. <laughs> there was a good amount of this uh exact Rhodes electric piano um definitely more on um the some b-sides like it's very prominently featured on let the cards fall 
Uh, I was doing my best uh, Ray Manzarek from Doors, um, the Doors impression, and uh, it was a it was a just a fun time for all of those first mini album. I mean, it still is, but just getting to explore and there were so many firsts. Like, get we got to go to Guitar Center and pick up gear and with with Saints help, and it was uh, definitely oh, fun. A, big time yeah yeah any any band i mean having the means to then get gear at a certain point and then going with like your favorite producer that just sounds I and mean, that's like a montage in a, in a movie right there that's that's great that's yeah. incredible it's in a yeah. candy store yeah yeah just it was just really great experience you know um great a great time period you know because i think on the blue record you know just uh technically we obviously were still recording on tape back then, but, and we actually recorded on two inch tape and it was 16 track, but the, the main instruments, meaning the drums, the guitar, the bass, the vocals, I believe that was all on 16 track, two inch tape. I guess for everyone at home that doesn't know if, if you just take two inches of tape and you divide it by 24, that's a certain amount of room on the tape. Well, if you do it with 16, that's a certain amount of room on the tape um, as well. So it's it's a bigger, fatter, more present sound, basically is what you get because you have more room per tape, more room per signal. You know, even back then, I mean, that's, you know, just always going for the best, basically, is no matter what a pain in the ass it is to get the 16 track heads and no matter what a pain in the ass it is to change them out and you know it's put that on an actual 24 track machine you always had to put either the bass or the kick on track one because of like the edge effect it would always have more low end than the other tracks that's why kick or bass was always on track one right yeah i remember one day we got ripped away from the session because there was a white Bronco going through the the freeways of Los Angeles and it had, had OJ Simpson in the back of it and his friend, you know, we got ripped away from it. And Ron was like, not screaming at the TV at that time, but it was, it was really exciting. You know, we got, we all got wrapped up in it. I'll, I'll never forget where I was and who I was with. And it was sure. while we were in the blue album when that, when that happened. You know, really, I think the band at that time was on a tra trajectory of, of reaching a level, right? And we hadn't gotten there yet. I think in total, that record, that third album was a culmination of what we were aspiring to at that time. And Saint was the one to capture it. You know, Saint was the one to really coalesce what we had been building for a couple of years and a couple of records prior and <clears throat> to really collect it to make a bigger impact to get the point across of what this band was about you know because we were still it was still you know we we weren't there yet we weren't on solid ground we weren't a band that we could you know we could uh take for granted that we were going to you know, do well in the future. I mean, it was still, it was, um, it was a process of, you know, of, of believing in yourself and, and reaching that point in time to feel as if what you were doing was, um, getting across. So I think <clears throat> that's the cool thing about that whole record and work with Saint at that time. Just a fantastic period and fantastic tones and, going for the gusto and watching his plane fly over the thing, watching him work. He has all this energy. He would do this move where he would kind of, he would hear something and automatically squat uh, and then, and then just put his arms it, like beneath like these huge fucking balls. He would just be like, Oh, and look around. And that it's just, it was just awesome. It's just motivation and energy and making that project go, man. It was just just a great period of time. I wish I could experience it again. Man, I mean, it's 
good that these guys that were kind of collaborating to collect the memories because I didn't realize how much of that remember the mood and like I remember certain days and the overall time period and being in the studio and just kind of being a magical ride in a way somehow it was like a culmination of all the energy that had been on tour and having it all in the room at the same time and having saint there at the same time was just there was no other destiny or no other destination except platinum you know yeah it was magical yeah it just felt it felt the whole time really doing something meaningful and something that would be remembered for a while and i think we achieved it i i just see the blue album as a culmination of a lot of things falling into place one is definitely that we were getting close to our first 10,000 hours of playing by how long we toured uh, on just living on the road during grassroots and really getting our chops up and then meeting Saint and having real top of the line gear to work with. And it was just the convergence of so many things. And we came from like an alternative philosophy where we would just stick to what we do best and wait for, you know, culture to come around to us and kind of appreciate what we're doing and uh that was a it all happened around those years 95 96 and it was pretty overwhelming come on What the fuck? What the fuck? What's up? Yeah, yeah. 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 dang it. How'd you move that fast? Yeah, man. He still got it. He's springing. Right He's springing. Yeah. Can you hear us? You guys are awfully quiet. Uh oh. Can you, can you, can you hear us? The audio is really low. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, we got yeah. you. Whoa. All right, you guys sound like you you went to the moon. Oh, oh shit. Man. Mic check, mic uh, check. The blue album. Can you hear Childhood, us? Childhood dreams. Oh, you can't hear us at all. Nah. There you go. Hey, all right. Hey, 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 yeah. You know what? What's up, guys? What's up? You hanging? Just do this for an hour. Dude, I gotta say, two ninety ninety eight eyes. Look at this shit. <laughs> <laughs> We are some lucky motherfuckers. <laughs> Were you in a session? What's going on? Were you in a session? Were you mixing or something today? Uh, I got something up. I could turn that screen off. Is that too bright in the back? Nah, so, right? nah. nah I'm just wondering what you're doing. Good, oh. good to see all you country motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So, uh, how's everybody doing? Good. We're doing great. We just got done with rehearsal, running that blue record and some of the B-sides as well. Uh huh. I was trying to remember the, uh, the very first time that we met you. Did you come probably to our Macapa house? Uh, no, man. It was New Orleans. For, for Wasn't it? First Didn't I fly there first? Was See, you played and then went out, or was that for the second record? You got me. Boy, I don't know. <laughs> man. I, all I can recall... Dude, I, I, I think I saw you in uh, with the Reina. We flew to New Orleans, saw you play. It was the last night. You drove back. And then uh, I met you there, and we started pre-pro. Wow. Well, if it was New Orleans, we probably can't remember anything. So Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. Well, I have to say, you are the only band uh, I ever met that had a an endorsement with graphics before they had a record deal. <laughs> <laughs> Relaxing yeah. is important. Honestly. Yeah, well, I definitely remember the house you guys were living in. That was a beautiful setup in, in um, kind of in Laurel Canyon, wasn't it? Oh, it was above the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. Near, near there. Yeah. It was in the mountains. Yeah. Swimming pool out back. Yeah. Got to give everybody a ride in the airplane. Yeah. Yeah. Probably Peanuts' last ride in a private plane ever. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that. That yeah. shit was crazy. 
don't yeah. know how you talked me into that. Yeah, buzz in the house. Oh, come on, man. You trust me. Yeah, yeah. That was that crazy. Was it. It's all about building the trust. That, that was hilarious. You <laughs> buzz in our house and everything. That I mean, you great. were coming straight for it. Yeah. <laughs> and you pulled up at the last minute. <laughs> Like, this is straight up. Well, I was an Air Force brat, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and one of the times that you came out to work with us, you had to do an emergency landing because you had a fire in the engine, like over Colorado or something. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Uh, I was on the ground. It was a restart. It was a hot restart. You know where it was? It was in uh, Winslow, Arizona. Wow. Route 66. And it was like a, a 109 on the ground. And uh, it just was a hot restart, and it built up the fumes, and the fumes lit. But, yeah, I took a, a train. <laughs> That's the way. Took a train, then I took the subway, actually. To, uh, it's the only time I rode the L.A. subway. And it worked from, from downtown right right to, to just a, a couple blocks away from NRG. Do you remember how you first heard about these guys? I forgot who brought them to my attention. I thought Nick called me, but but I don't know. I didn't have a manager, so... I think I, I, you know, Adam called me. Mm, yeah. And uh, it was, it was eye against eye, understandable. Uh, I, and I have to say out of, God, I don't know, over a quarter of a billion records out of everything I've done. And I've done, I could, there's at least three diamond platinums, maybe four, but a lot of numbers. But out of all those major, major sellers, the eye against eye record has gotten me more work than anything I have ever done. Wow. Wow. It got you guys and yeah. tons of others. And, and it, it's just one of those things. And, and, you know, according to Greg Ginn over there at SST, it never went gold, which <laughs> yeah. I think is a bunch of shit, but right. whatever. <laughs> it, it, it's an amazing record and, and it's in my personal top 10 of all time. As is the blue album, I must say. Yes, guys, I think uh, I think you're all about as old as I was when I first came out there. I think Kedush, I was 46. Yeah, we're older. So we're older than that. you're older than 46. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh no fucking way! All, God damn! <laughs> all in our 50s. We're all in our 50s. Well, shit. <laughs> well, okay, you're closer. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you're closer. You, you ain't catching up, but you're closer. <laughs> hey, we, but, have a, um, we, have a, we have a trivia question on uh -oh. on with the quickness. Yeah. On with that song. What's the, what's the name of the song? Is that you or is that HR? That's HR. It's a bass, no, player. It's a bass, bass player. player. It's Daryl. That's Daryl. It's Daryl. It's Darryl. Let me tell you how I snaked him into doing that. He was teaching Doc Lick. Right. I didn't know it at the beginning of the thing, and they were over in the corner, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, we were still setting up. And I said, fuck. As soon as I got it set up and, and got the sounds while they were still rehearsing, I went over to Daryl when he was uh, talking kind of right in between the, the room mics. I said, yo, man, sing that lick again for me. What was that? He didn't know the tape was rolling. I, I hit record and came in. And I said, would you sing that thing for me again, please? Man? <laughs> he says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's where I made the edit. That's awesome. And I have to say, one of my most favorite intros of all time. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Such a that was Mackie. That was, that was Mackie on the drums. Yeah, I know. I remember. So, I remember. And, you know, Daryl didn't even know until till it came to the mix. And he, he says, oh, you sneaky motherfucker. That's why you came over and made me sing that thing. And I said, well, I didn't have it rolling when you sang it to Doc, so I had to get you to sing it again. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's how that happened. Came out all right. Yeah. There's, some, there's, some, there's some stuff on there I'd like to cover. Maybe we should think about it. Down, you know. That, that was the launch for you guys, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, when you think about it, I uh, I didn't know. I hadn't heard about you guys until Adam called. And I went out and got the records. And I listened. I said, holy shit, man. There's a there was there's two or three songs you guys did out of those first two records. I said, fuck, fuck. I wish I did that. Fuck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you hear something, you say, god damn it. What happened? Yeah. And... Uh, 
And then uh, when we started working, I thought, holy shit, we got it. And that was your third album. I, I, th- I don't know which came first, Grassroots, or, or uh, what was it uh, music. 311 Music? Yeah. Music, yeah. Music, okay. So music and then Grassroots. And, and, and um, didn't, didn't you guys work with uh, Eddie Offord on that? Yeah, on music, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I met him. You know, he, he did some of my favorite records, the Yes stuff. You guys must have. I love that. We used to go into Studio A, which was an old church. And uh, really high ceilings. Um, I mean, it was a big old Baptist church in the middle of Manhattan on 57th Street. And it happened to be 311 West 57th. No way. <laughs> way, dude. Way. And I was there for five years. Yes. Wow. Uh, it, it's crazy. And and uh, <laughs> means even more now. But we turn on those Yes songs and we, get, we would be setting up for strings at 730 in the morning because they were getting there at 8. Or 8.30. I was really glad, you know, you guys called because it was a third album. And there's there's something that happens. First albums and third albums. If if a band doesn't come out the door with a hit on their first album, which is extremely, extremely rare, on their third album, they've gotten over the sophomore effort. They've matured. They've been on the road. They got some, some salt behind them. And you guys were ready. And when I heard you, you, you play... I said, "Holy shit!" Because that—that—that's it was uh, New Orleans, and 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 I said, "Yeah, these guys can play. It's going to be okay. This is going to be good." I, I hate to not uh, see a band and, and and work with them. It's 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 really not not a good good omen to <laughs> work with a band you haven't seen play live. And wow, um, I mean, it was pretty pretty obvious. Uh, it was just about getting the songs together and knowing what the fuck you were doing and getting that performance because your performance is, is what it's all about. And I know you were talking about the, the tape thing and yeah, it was that transition time. The thing is that I'm uh, getting to with, with the, with the tape is, is it requires a performance, yeah. um, you know, and, and that's really it. I, so many people just have lost the passion. Yeah. And they, 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 they don't want to play live, you know. Uh, they'll send me 20 fucking takes of a solo and say, you figure the fuck you, play it. What do you mean? <laughs> you know, yeah, I can, I can do this. But then I got to send it back and forth. And, and everything is like disconnected. It, 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 there's, that fire is not there. And that's why this record is one of your best ever. And, and I think Down was probably your biggest hit until... We got to top that with Amber. Yeah. Five, six years later, whenever it was, I don't know. Um, was that the one? You, it was an album in between Scotch and you guys went and did did uh, uh, the next one after after the Blue album, the Transistor. Yeah. And then was it from Chaos? No, then one more sound system with a few pad jumping. Sound system. Oh, that was the one with the race car driver guy that. Yeah. Stepped out, right? You bet. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the British Bob Clearmount. He's the producer, yeah. The British Bob Clearmount, I called him. Oh, no, he's good. He made some great records. Don't get me wrong. Oh, he yeah. did. But, yeah. uh, he was just putting gas in his, his, his race car. <laughs> That's true. Uh, <laughs> That's true. Um, any, anyway, yeah. So, so after that one, yeah, it was from Chaos, and then it was Evolver. But... Man, the blue album, man, everything just connected. Had that? Uh, did you guys have that eraser board, or did we get a piece of paper? Was it was it kind of like big paper, and we do the the bar charts like we did? Oh yeah, intros and blah, 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 yeah. go down. Everybody would play it, and yeah. you guys would play it exactly as it was, and yeah. Then we'd go through and say, okay, this is, goes away, and that's too long, and pull this up, and everybody could see it. So it's just the bar charts, you know, four, one, two, three, four the slash mark across the three for the bar so we all knew where we were but i don't think any of us really read music <laughs> we show not feel it we had some pretty fucking great times in, in nrg man yeah I, I remember before we tracked we, <laughs> you had those bongs i swear to god they were three feet long right Pete? yeah, yeah we and, and the, you yeah, guys, i think we're taking like... the last hit before we we started tracking that's true and you guys have broken a bong and we broke one all around, and then we went in the studio. And you say, no, 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 one more, one more, one more. 
took a hit and boom, that I dropped that motherfucker. He said, "Ah, oh, don't worry about it. We got a we got an endorsement." I said, "Oh shit, that felt so bad." But they had to sweep it up and everything. Yeah, I was laughing his ass off, sat behind the drums, man, and we just fucking hit it. The shit was blazing. Yeah, yeah, that's blazing. You went a uh, sixteen track, two inch on that. Remember? Yep. Yes, of course. Yeah. Fifteen IPS. Later on, you went to the one inch masters for like Evolver. Well, that machine wasn't invented when we did it. Uh, we, we mixed to the half inch. Yeah. We mixed the half inch tape, which which was was great. Uh, but the one inch, I mean, one inch used to be eight track. Jim Hendrix used to record eight tracks on one inch tape. I didn't mean to kind of scatter out, man. I know it's it's all about uh, the blue album, but you know all that shit kind of got us together. And, That's right. Uh, yeah. 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 And we, we um, learned so much from you and had so much fun doing it. I'm so glad. Well, that the you know, crossed. we ain't dead. <laughs> That's right. You got the you got the same board I do now. You got it because I wanted it back then. And you made that dream come true. <laughs> That's so true. It is That's true. Ron's saying, what's up, man? I'm still representing you, dude. Woo! Yeah, Scott. He's like, who the fuck is that? I, I can see. <laughs> He's all in disguise. Hey, and, and hats off, Scott. Uh, one of the things that Nick and I talked about, man, uh, and it was the last thing that he kind of said after we were sort of all the way there, he wanted to make sure that I had already swallowed the hook, you know, which, which I did uh, gladly. But he said, listen, Ron, man, there's one question I got to ask you, man. Uh, we've got this guy. Uh, he's been working with us, you know, on, uh, for a long time now. And he was with us, you know, when we did some demos and his last two records and he he's been out on the road with us he really knows us and would you mind working with him as your assistant i said not at all man i uh, i will say this uh, i did give him a little caveat i said if he ain't cutting the mustard i'm gonna let you know and we might have to get somebody who can but you're still there and i'm not <laughs> <laughs> part of the team that's it oh, yeah. uh, if ever we get to do something together again your ass is going to be there oh, wow. let's yeah. do it now hey it ain't up to you and me <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> can we twist arms through this fucking zoom is it the way to do that <laughs> you're getting close <laughs> <laughs> It is almost like kind of amazing that we got as good of performances as we did out of each other because we were having so much fun just being around each other, you know, like, like Nick oh, kind of said. the fact is, man, you know, and like what we're doing here's right how now. I look at it. We're in a fucking music business, and we're making music. <laughs> so if you ain't having fun, something is wrong. <laughs> Plain. Right. It's wrong. Yeah, it's true. Something is wrong. Nick, I don't know if you remember this, man. When we finished that record and we played it back, I said, God damn, man, we got the gold. And you just came by nice and cool and you said, platinum. <laughs> 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 and it went triple platinum. It took a year to get the momentum, but at about month 13 or 14, that motherfucker went triple platinum. Yep. Yeah. It's an exciting time. And it, yeah. it, you guys worked that shit on the road. It was that third album, Magic. That's the one. And that's why back when there were record companies, real record companies, that if you had a Bruce Springsteen or a Michael Jackson, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> or, uh, you know, anybody that's like super, super, superstars, it allowed them the funds mm -hmm. to sign 15 new bands right. and develop them. And they weren't looking to get their money back out the door. They they supported you for three years. They they did promotion for you. They put you on the road with bands. They they supported you. They gave you tour support. And if by the end of your third record something didn't come through, well then don't go away mad. Just just go away. But at least you got to the third album. And that's why that first and third album are so important. The first albums set the bar so high because you've had your whole life to write the songs right 
and and uh, they're real familiar with him. You know, you, you got all of that, and you bring that to it, and holy shit, we got to hit out the door. Now what? So now you're a sophomore, and that's what I was talking about with the sophomore thing because you 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 tend to get a little cocky if you've had a big big hit, and yeah, and, yeah, and all of a sudden you got to come up with a record in, in less than a year, and it's got to beat what you already did, which makes it real hard. But if you haven't, and those first two records cooked a little, like your first one did somewhere in the 40s, somewhere between 40 and 50. The next one was bubbling up around in, in the 70s. And yeah, that's, that's progress. But then number three came and the shit went out of the park. And it went out for a reason. Because you guys were right. You were ready. You were prime. The songs were there. The confidence was there. And it was, you know, stepping up to the plate. It was Super Bowl time, and you fucking delivered, and you delivered live, as you always do, in the studio. Yeah, well, we're glad yeah, you were there yeah, for man. it. Man. Hey, it, it was, it was where we are today because of you. Thank you. Hey, it was how it was supposed to be. You know, I do know that uh, when I came back to Cali, everybody had fly houses and blazing rides, <laughs> including me. <laughs> and and it came really off the blue album and the blue album set us all up and i thank you for that yeah it's good times man good times in the 90s yeah. you know but, it was fantastic man yeah it was fantastic and here we are man i'm i'm just proud to have been a you know a little piece of it big piece yeah big really piece. really uh means a lot and uh thank you yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Couldn't you, have done it without you, man. I couldn't have done it without hey. you. If I didn't thank you, you <laughs> then just let me do it now. <laughs> right on, buddy. Thanks for enjoy. Uh, thanks for joining oh, us sweet, today. Dude. Much love, you guys. Love you. I'm gonna be on the show. I wish I could be there with you. Hey, Scott, are you mixing? Which oh, yes. Yeah, he is. Fantastic. All right. Yeah, everything is right. Well, listen, I'm going to give it, be putting my ears on it. Make me proud, fellas. Be yeah, ready. Oh, yeah, man. We will. All All right. Our best. Much love. All right. Blue Thanks, man. Say. Love you, Blue Say. Sky. Blue Blue skies. Love you, too, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> 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 <laughs>